you're listening to the Simply Vegan podcast, the show that's all about making veganism easy, fun and accessible. Brought to you by the team at Vegan Food and Living, the UK's best-selling vegan magazine, you can catch us every Tuesday and every Thursday. Well, I'm pleased to say that we can finally bring you the interview with Heather Mills. Um, She is a fascinating woman, um, as you will discover, you know, listening to the interview. Um, So much knowledge, very intelligent. Um, She's worked on so many projects. She had, you know, three businesses by the age of 20. Really, really interesting and inspiring story that she has. Also slightly controversial. But, you know, she's not afraid to express her views. So I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Heather Mills, activist and founder of V-Bytes. Welcome to the show. It's really good to have you on today. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, we had a few mix-ups, didn't we? But we got there in the end. You're obviously a very busy lady. <laughs> yeah, a lot a lot of travelling. Um, and it's it's hard to find anywhere where there's a bandwidth for two minutes um, yeah. other than a toilet but then you're going to get lots of uh, background noise of yeah. flushing which is not that attractive <laughs> not ideal no well I mean so many people have heard of you but I don't think a lot of people realize what a kind of an extraordinary life you've had I mean I know I didn't until I sort of started to do my research um, I mean for a start you built and sold three businesses by the age of 20 how how on earth did you do that well um <laughs> <laughs> it was survival originally, and it was um, my mum left when I was nine. Obviously, from my accent, you can tell I'm a Geordie. Um, <laughs> even though I'm very, very travelled, it gets stronger every time I go up to the factories. But I tried to speak Langsam um, slowly uh, on my travels <laughs> so people can understand me. But yeah, my mum left when I was nine because my dad thought it was a reincarnation of Richard Wagner, the opera composer. And he was totally nuts. And he was the chairman of the Theatre Royal in Newcastle. Um, And we didn't see her for about three or four years. And then he got himself in a lot of financial trouble trying to fund an audiovisual presentation and an animated film of Wagner's Ring and eventually went to prison. And then my mum turned up, who we hadn't seen for years, and said, right, it's either going home in Newcastle or come and live with me and my partner. So... We moved here with him. He was a West End theatre actor who didn't really want kids around. So I ran away when I was a teenager, um, lived on the streets for about six months and then got a um, a home in a travelling fair. And then the guy that was really like my big brother died of a drugs overdose, which is why I never, ever tried drugs in my life. And um, I eventually basically thought my dad might change when he came out of prison but he didn't and I was sitting in a dentist and I saw these things called stick on bras and I had really big boobs that were really annoying in sport because I was very athletic so I used to sort of strap them down with black masking tape and um because my mum wasn't around we didn't know much about bras yeah and um and I started um selling stick on bras in a b c d e cup and eventually saw that as a a licensed franchise um made a lot of money and then went on to import um frozen yogurt when I didn't know anything about veganism thinking that must be better for you than ice cream and it was the Jane Fonda 1980s era and then I saw that and then I accidentally got involved in modeling um (laughs) and then I realized that that was a basic um nightmare of a business so I set up a model agency to protect models from um, being taken advantage of in the industry called Excel Um, and then I sold that and went on holiday with the husband at the time's ex-wife to the former Yugoslavia fell in love with that and ended up living over in the then Yugoslavia. I mean that is a lot for you know a 20 year old to have done and been through all of that it's just a bit mind-blowing really I mean you must have a kind of inbuilt entrepreneurial spirit I mean you know where does that come from do you think it's kind of passed down from your parents or yeah I mean I think um the mad parts that I got from my dad was the entrepreneurial side um and luckily didn't pick up the other bits and 
from my mum's side, she was a top psychologist at the Royal Marsden Cancer Hospital in London. Um, and she lectured and was very much a homeopath and acupuncturist. She brought homeopathy and acupuncture into the Royal Marsden Cancer Hospital. So my sort of side of alternate medicine and things was quite influenced by her, even though she left when I was very young. Um, we were brought up with you know no medication and everything completely natural so right. that was sort of instilled in me for from a young age so um, I've got a bit of both of them you know yeah. um, I used to have the the really bossy side um, of my dad because you know I thought I knew best um, <laughs> yeah. and now I'm now I'm I'm 54 I'm a bit more sort of laid back and think it's important to let people make mistakes and then come to you later and say oh actually you know <laughs> yeah. that was correct um because I, I made loads of mistakes when I was younger so as long as no one's going to hurt themselves I think it's important to make mistakes in life so yeah I just um I'm a problem solver I would say which incorporates being an entrepreneur but it doesn't necessarily have to be entrepreneurial you know it's do you call charity work entrepreneurial you know um outside of of business it's it's more about that's the problem this is the solution we don't want animals to be killed we don't want the environment to be harmed we don't want people's health to continue to deteriorate mm -hmm. um and we can do that by creating things that are going to facilitate that but at the same time um, only if we create the solutions do those things have any chance of evolving and having a, an effect on us. So I can't bear it when I talk to people and they go on and on and on about an issue and I say, yep, you're right, yep, yep. And yeah. what's your solution? Yeah, and exactly. what's your solution? And they're like, oh, uh, well, <laughs> it, I don't need to have a solution. It just, it, that's what's going on. And I went, yeah, we know it's been going on for ages. What is your solution? Yeah. So I think I'm more of a problem solver. I don't see any boundaries. I don't see any walls. Um, I take risks. I don't worry about what people think, um, you know, that, that with, you know, sort of government levels and things. And I think, if you want to make a difference, you have to sort of park that to one side and say, look, what am I trying to achieve here? Yeah. And yes, you're going to upset people. Um, but as long as it's not harming them, it's, it's, it's for the greater good, then you just have to, you know, go on your path and, and get on with it. But also keep your ears open for, for learning along the way, because we all think we know it all. But I've really learned the hardest way to 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 realize that things are not black and white Definitely. and you have to fix things in different areas you know when we got the dog and cat fur ban in the eu i had to work with the furriers and with what people call you know the opposition to create a situation to create the law by saying okay you might not care about um fox mink and sable but surely you care about dog and cat just to get them to vote on our side for consumer duping because people yeah. were wearing dog, dog and cat and they didn't know mm. so it's just you know working out always put your mind in the head of the opposed because yeah. if you don't you don't create any solution and you bring about no, zero change just shouting and not understanding yeah. how do you satisfy them that's brilliant advice so you're in you what was Yugoslavia you're not vegan at this time are you and you get into charity no. and um, campaigning um, and then it was when you came so you came back to the UK after living there and yeah bizarrely I should have lost my leg out there in the landmines and the war yeah that I was working in on the front line for, for years but I came back and crossed the street a piece of motorcycle chopped my leg off crushed my pelvis punctured my lung and split my head open and they told my family say goodbye four times but um you know fortunately for me I came back I don't know about fortunately for some of my family they probably <laughs> <laughs> oh god um, no, no I'm joking and um and and I was lying in bed and my girlfriend said you gotta go vegan and I was like what on earth is that I was 25 year old Geordie sausage and mash girl yeah 
and didn't I was as um, ignorant as everybody else that had never understood veganism and I just thought it was you know 1960s hippies with hairy armpits and Birkenstocks yeah. I didn't I didn't <laughs> think anything else um and and then I learned you know I went off he I'd been in hospital five months um oh, infection in my time. leg they kept amputating my leg more and more and then I went um and I thought I'll try anything so I was like vegan schmegan whatever it is I couldn't care less just let me try and she took me to Hippocrates uh, which was extreme vegan for people that were ill and I healed in two weeks on wheatgrass and sprouts and juicing and you know garlic poultices everywhere and then I wrote a book about it that went to charity and funded um more things and started to study it more and more um and then realized that you know I needed to start creating products if I was going to be able to go out and not just be given the chef's delights of grilled <laughs> vegetables and sorbet yeah. um yeah. so I thought I need to set up restaurants I need to set up you know places you can go I still wanted to eat a burger I still wanted cheese on my pizza but I just didn't want to harm the animals, the environment uh, and my health. So that's when I started developing all the products for V-Bites mm. um, to create solutions. So I developed the first McDonald's uh, plant burger in 2003, took wow. that over to Chicago. They said it was too early. Um, and when the head guy, Jim Skinner, would leave, then Mike Roberts and Mike Donahue would implement it. Um, they were taking way too long. So I went to Burger King and presented um, the plant-based Whopper um, to RBI in Zurich and started that process of getting them to get into the vegan sector um, and just went behind the scenes and and showed the uneducated food sector that actually there was a demand for this, mm. not focusing on the environment, focusing on the only thing they care about is their margins and EBITDA and showing that there would be a demand and it took years and years and years. And that's the stuff that I do behind the scenes. Um, a bit like with the government, you know, trying to influence them a lot to start moving into, you know, creating more healthy food in the NHS and in schools and so many simple, quick, easy solutions, but it's just like moving a massive corporate mm -hmm. ship. And V Bites is very much a you know a bunch of pirates that just jump all over the place trying to make a difference. But you've got to be able to communicate with the corporate people, and you've got to be able to give them solutions uh, financially. Otherwise, it doesn't work because they don't care less about the environment. They don't care less about health or the animals. They just care about money. End yeah. of. So you have to make them richer with healthier food. It's a sad state of affairs, really, isn't it? Well, hopefully the next hopefully the next generation like your generation will be the people that influence and get into power to make change and don't get dictated to um, by, you know, huge corporates literally do what's right and what helps the, you know, the country. If they'd listened years ago and, and invested in self, in, in self-sufficiency and procurement, we wouldn't have this food shortage that we have. We wouldn't have the dependency on petrol and gas. They would, they should have, you know, been investing in these sectors decades ago so you came to veganism through sort of health but then you said you sort of read up on it and everything so did it sort of become much more about the animals after that or were you always like an animal lover before I was always an animal lover but like everyone I didn't connect the meat yeah. on my plate to the Same, cow in yeah. the field it was just literally you know, it's it's a bit like people who run around seeing they love animals with dogs and cats and then they've got a fur coat on. It's like, yeah. well, you obviously don't. <laughs> but I was one of those naive people once and I basically, you know, ate meat and fish and never really liked cheese, luckily. Um, was a bit of a chocoholic. And, um, and then when I healed myself, of course, then I went vegan for health. And then I started to look and go, oh, I'm not eating that cow in the field. I'm not eating and it. And it really started to to sink in. And then I started studying and getting involved um, with the United Nations and World Health Organizations and things and, and started learning about the environment. 
and the causes of it. And this is decades and decades ago and, and working behind the scenes and just being called the nutter all the time because you, you were pointing out the truth and the easiest way to put you back in your box was to say she's crazy yeah. rather than um, actually we're, we're right, she's right. And, and so are the people working with us, but we don't want to change. So let's just make her out to be the crazy so we can justify not changing yeah obviously people perhaps weren't ready back then but hopefully they're more open to the uh conversation right now well they are now i mean i speak to the government a lot um things are changing you know i created the the highest strain of algae in uh, 15 years ago because i realized a tiny percentage of vegans couldn't convert a short chain fatty acid from flax to a long chain fatty acid so i said we need a solution for that and I couldn't believe how many people think omega-3 comes from fish and it doesn't. It comes from the algae the fish eat. So yeah. I thought we need to shout about that. So we set up the omega-3 um, and an algae plant, which every one and a half tons depletes CO2 by 2.5 tons. And now the government are really excited about that and want to start looking at how can we do more of that in the UK? Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, I create so many vegan products that are now huge in America um, because the UK were just not interested. Mm. You know, the consumer was, yeah. but the government had no interest in supporting manufacturing. So when we could have been the suppliers of the product to Burger King and McDonald's, the government and the banks wouldn't support us. And our little factory that we had in Corby certainly wasn't big enough to do it. So we had to, you know, hand that you know, to America and other countries, which is a real shame because that could have been huge business for the UK. Yeah. So it's a different situation now because we're, we're the largest manufacturers, um, manufacturing sites in the world for vegan, meat, fish and dairy free. So yeah. it's another world now, but it was a hell of a journey and um, 20 hour days, seven days a week and mortgaging the house and putting everything on the line to make it happen. But it was worth it. Yeah, well done for sticking with it. Um, so you kind of, you know, you were to heal um, when your leg, you know, kept getting infected. You were kind of went ultra, ultra healthy. You were, you know, like you said, you were having wheatgrass and smoothies and all this. Have you kind of kept that kind of diet? Because it was, there's kind of like a, a difference, isn't there, between like V-bikes is obviously the more, I don't want to say processed because obviously that that implies that it's unhealthy. All 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 the all the V bites is any um, alternate meat, fish, and dairy are, are just healthier junk food. Yeah. So you know that don't harm the animals, the planet, and the environment, and yeah. don't do any major damage to your health as meat and dairy do. But they're not, you know, the ultimate nutrition. So, but they are the solution for junk eaters. And whether you're a junk eater daily, three times a day or once a week, that is your alternate go to rather than meat and dairy. Yeah. But it's obviously not your ultimate. So what we've done literally with millions of people around the world now um, is shown that there's a process um, and stages. If you're seriously ill, you go immediately to clean, clean, vegan, sprouting, wheatgrass, all that. If you're a person that lives off McDonald's and Burger King and you are addicted and cheese is, is, is an opiate, then you move to vegan fast food to replace mm -hmm. it. Then your metabolism changes, your taste buds change, and you eventually wean yourself off it and start introducing healthier foods. And that's the process that works because you're taking yourself off drugs, basically, yeah. um, and giving yourself, um, you know, a temporary situation and then you find that you go from having meat free uh fish free dairy free alternates to um from three times a day to once a day and then you find you go down to three times a week as you introduce lentils and beans and quinoa and vegetables and your taste beds get used to it so it's a transitional thing which is why the term we came up with flexitarian um came about and then eventually you find you don't want any alternate meats. You're into the entire lentils, beans, and thing. But then, and this is where nothing's black and white, if you are somebody, and usually it's over the age of 50, but you do, as in yesterday, I went to pick up a quinoa salad 
And I asked them not to put any cauliflower in. And the lady said, why? And I said, because I can't um, process fructans. And she went, neither can I. I'm on the FODMAP. I really have trouble. And being um, having to follow a FODMAP lifestyle because you don't have enough hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes and your microbiome is messed up for high stress or previous antibiotic use mm. through illness, um, and a number of other reasons, then a vegan diet is a nightmare. It's so difficult to follow. So you have to, you know, follow like the Monash FODMAP University so that you can really eliminate uh, things to find out if you are sensitive to fructans or mannitols or sorbitols or oligosaccharides or whatever. So then I went, holy moly, now I'm going to have to come up with recipes um, <laughs> that I can actually digest because vegan saved my life and saved my leg uh for 30 years but now i have to eliminate things and reset my microbiome and do all sorts of stuff because i had a burst appendix my gallbladder was taken out i had lyme's disease you know things come along yeah that you think you're on a path of perfection and something slaps you in the face and suddenly all you can eat is potatoes or white rice God. Or things and looking at beautiful salads, are things you can't go near. Yeah. So you have to be listening to your body individually and understand how things work. But ultimately, meat is is not good for anybody at all in any way whatsoever. Um, but cauliflower, if you can't digest it, will just sit and putrefy in your colon. So you, you need to really know what your body's going through. And this is for a tiny percentage of people. It's like people who are, you know, FODMAP following and celiacs and Crohn's. So what I'm working on now is a FODMAP ready meals so that people can continue to follow the path of veganism. But instead of garlic and onions, if they can't digest fructans, you know, we can use asafoetida for seasoning. We can use lots of things. But when you're new to vegan, that's like overwhelming. Yeah. So we have to continue to make fast food ready meals to help people go through their journey of understanding nutrition to keep them on the vegan lifestyle. Yeah. So nothing's black and white. Um, you know, most vegans have, you know, digestive acids and of a Rottweiler so they can like put anything down there, but I can't digest beans anymore. Right. So, um, Nightmare. you know, because of all the Lyme's disease and all the issues I've had and crushed pelvis with my colon and, you know, so there's idealism and there's realism, yeah. as I always say. So, yeah. so you might suddenly go vegan, but if you've always had digestive issues, you need to fix those first. You need to, and veganism will help you fix that. But just stay away from the vegetables that really give you lots of gas and bloating. Yeah. And um, there's plenty of nutrition in the other ones, so sort of courgettes and spinach and carrots are really neutral. But cauliflower is is um, is a difficult one unless you've got a brilliant digestive system. If you have, there's nothing better than having every kind of vegetable. But if you haven't, you can end up with massive cramps and real problems so yeah. it's understanding that I um I spoke to I don't know if you know Victoria Moran she's based in the US but I spoke to her she's Main Street vegan I spoke to her a few episodes ago and she was saying that you know it's not a good thing for us vegans to kind of uh, always feel like we you know that pressure to be ultra healthy and we haven't got any issues and we just eat all our fruit and veg and everything's amazing because that's not realistic it's not like you say it's um you know it's not realistic for everybody it's only a small percentage and it's usually one thing it's either a fructan or a sorbitol or a mannitol or fructose just like for other people it's a lactose you know that that there there, there can always be something but if you remove it and you reintroduce it slowly bit by bit you find out where your threshold is The biggest problem that new vegans have is they go from having shoved loads of meat and dairy through their colon and it's putrefied and the colon doesn't work efficiently. And then they shove a load of vegetables in it, but it's like pouring it on top of a block sink. You've got to introduce it slowly 
and you might have slow transit bowel movements. So you're just backfilling. So it's really important you make sure your you know your colon regularly moves and is cleansed and go for a colonic. You know, absolutely do that if you're if you're blocked because you can have the best food in your system, but if it's sitting there, it's poisonous and mm. putrefying. And then start again and 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 freshen it out and and work out where your limits are because you know there's a lot of fiber in vegetables so you really need to go easy but people who are gluttonous and go from McDonald's and Burger King to a big salad they'll sit and eat pounds and pounds and pounds of it and their body's not used to it it has to be introduced slowly yeah that's good advice I I could have done with that about four or five years ago I think not that I was eating burgers (laughs) all the time but (laughs) certainly a bit of a shock to the system um, yeah. so, I mean, you you have had a busy life. I mean, now, am I right in thinking you're helping Ukrainian refugees? Mm. So basically, yeah, I mean, I worked in the war on the front line for years. I've worked in six different war zones, um, created the largest landmine clearing charity in the world, and then um, basically set up prosthetic systems, um, care and things like that. So I've worked in human security um students at UCI uh, study my work um and basically they have scholarships there for 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 going around the world so whenever a war happens um then i know a lot about it and i know how to create a lot of solutions so i knew immediately when the ukraine war was going to happen that the food chain supply the obvious stuff would be a problem but when you provide donations, they have to tick the Ministry of Defence's every box to allow them into the country. So what I did was I created um, meat-free chunks, meal in a can with cheesy beans. So I utilised the 28 grams of protein that we have in Fee Bites meat-free alternates. And then I put in the allergen-free cheese because we make all the applewood smoky paprika and oh, Mexicana. Amazing. That's all our recipe um, and we manufacture all that. So, um, you know, we, we have a cheddar and a red uh, pepper jack and all sorts of other flavors. So with the, and we do all the cheese for Domino's pizza. That's wow. all ours. Um, so most of the stuff you see, we do it private label because we're the only massive 100% plant-based facility. If it's not coming from V-Bites, it's usually coming from mixed facilities. So you have to really trace your source. Right. Um, and what's really worrying is consumers are still buying Beyond Meat and all these other burgers that have been shipped from America rather than buy V-Bites online, which manufactures in the UK and creates, you know, UK business. So, yeah. you know, you get people harking on as vegans about the environment and then they don't look where their products are coming from. Yeah. They just grab them. So that's, that's a really, really, really important thing to, to, to look at. So what I did was do a buy one, give one campaign. So it was a non-profit where you buy. And literally, I wanted to do a money back guarantee because these cheesy beans are so phenomenal. It's 28 grams in a can with meat chunks. So a family of four can eat for under 10 pounds. And what it meant was we could ship out these um, meat-free cheesy beans and they had all the nutritional components that the Ukrainian refugees required, and you can eat them cold out of a can. So if they didn't have access to heating. So that's why um, I did that, because we knew there was going to be a demand. And sadly, having worked in the war in the former Yugoslavia, this war will go on for years. Mm. And because the Ukrainians are incredible providers of ingredients, there is a world shortage of gluten. Yeah. And gluten is in a lot of products. Um, so there's, there's and, you know, prices are going up because gluten's now doubled because the ingredient providers are, you know, having to pay more, but they're also maximizing the media. So you've seen it with your petrol prices. Shell have made the biggest profits in history. Um, so why our petrol prices are going up, I don't know, because their profits should be staying the same and they should just be adding on the increases because of the war. But it just shows how we're manipulated and and used um, between the media and uh, and the big corporates um, because we've known how to 
make electric cars and hybrid cars for years and years and years. But again, we want to control everybody with, with gas and oil and petrol. And, and this has to change. You know, it really has to change. So, yeah, we're doing that with the um, for the refugees. It's the civilians that are the innocent ones. Yeah, it's a desperately sad situation and um, we need more people who are solution focused like you. Um, do you do you kind of like plan, you know, do you have a long term plan or do you just kind of respond to situations as they arise? Well, I mean, it's both because obviously I have to make long term plans because I've got nine businesses um, from that side. But as far as charity stuff, we have to make we have to make plans, um, you know, for the animal sanctuaries that we do and. Um, you know, for helping farmers convert from dairy farms into oat farms or into uh, pea farms or rapeseed or ensure them that they can make money for it. So we've got, you know, our day-to-day plans, but my brain works with problem solving. So when someone, when I see that we are becoming more and more vegan and dairy is going to become less and less, my concern is, um you know it's absolutely fantastic but what about the farmers um and and you know how can we keep them in business and convert them so in norway um who were one of the first recently to take away subsidies um for dairy farming and meat farming which is great the vegans will say and it is absolutely great because now we're going to be on a level pegging in those countries but why can't we if they have arable land encourage those subsidies to go to train farmers to to grow ingredients to create self-sufficiency so that's what we've been doing the uk are a bit slow on it but now the government are finally listening um and now we've proven that it works you can make a 12 to 17 percent ebitda on the same land growing grain that can be turned into vegan product than growing grain to go into cows to feed meat or you know growing cows to feed dairy so now that's an absolute proven, but it's again, it's 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 having to have spent the last couple of decades proving that they don't just believe it because they're they're ignorant and they don't want to you know upset the farmers and, and and instead people think they're getting milk cheap but they're actually paying for it out of their taxes because we are subsidising it. It is not cheap. It is very expensive to make. So. We need to make sure all the boxes are ticked. And and that's my day-to-day life usually is, you know, with a hairnet on under a, a machine that's broken down that six engineers have stood there scratching their heads about. And I'm going, well, don't you think it's this screw that's sticking out that's creating the hole in the Mac pack, for God's sake? You know, it's like, it's just common sense. I, I, you know, the government need to create common sense life skill classes compulsory in every school you know um, I had a friend of mine when my car went and I said take my car and I'll borrow yours the 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 the, the, the wheel's gone well, what do I do with it well, where do I take it what do I and I'm like and this person's so highly educated they didn't even know what to do with a tire yeah. um, or how to blow it up <laughs> so if you don't teach those multifunctional skills you're never going to survive or grow or thrive in life you're always going to be sitting in a box um of yeah i think we need you as prime minister (laughs) (laughs) i think i would upset a lot of people well they all do though don't they i mean i don't think anyone's particularly happy with boris right now (laughs) i know you know the thing is a lot of people who go into politics because i've been involved in politics for since 19 well since the war since 91 um and a lot of people do genuinely go into politics for the right reasons but then because it's so controlled it's like well you vote that and i'll vote yours and and they start to you know negotiate on things but at the same time they fear the media and our politics is controlled by the media. So until we regulate the media and stop letting them abuse, and until the public stop buying that crap, you're never going to improve your country because you're just going to repeat the bullshit verbatim um, no matter what. So until that changes, until the end consumer changes in their choice in food, in their choice in 
in, in politics and certainly in their choice in, in, in what media they, they read and believe, we're never going to improve Britain. You know, you go to places like Austria, where I, where I do a lot of work, it's a whole other world. They don't have nonstop gossip mongering media papers. The, the country is clean. The taxes go on, you know, the right things. And we're so far behind because we're so worried about what the media say about the government. Whereas we need to have a government in place that doesn't care what they say, who's honest about their past. Who cares if someone slept with someone or someone you know, came out as gay, you know, it's fabulous. You know, they're part of real people in communities. But those politicians fear that rather than just come out and embrace it and say, yes, yeah, so what? what's that got to do with my policy? What's that got to do with anything? Does that make me, you know, unable to run the country? No, I'm human, just like you. And people who judge you, you know, and throw stones, they're living in glass houses themselves. So... You know, that's where this whole gossip mongering, it's very British, has to end and use that energy to problem solve, make a difference, get together and take no crap. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Heather, and taking the time out from all the amazing projects that you're uh, you're working on. And we look forward to seeing what you've uh, what you you come up with next. And hopefully you'll be at Vegan Camp Out because I'm speaking there in July and um, taking the, the V-Bytes Airstream trailer there. So hope to see you all there. Amazing. Well, we'll see you there. Take care.